Uh, so this is one of the most important question or topic, I should say, from this esophageal diseases, esophageal cancer. Uh, the surgeon really loves to ask a question from this important topic. Now, to begin with, let me uh, tell you some important points right here. Esophageal cancer is considered one of the poorest cancer, okay, in terms of prognosis. The prognosis is really poor because patient may present late. One of the important symptoms is progressive dysphagia. And by the time dysphagia occurs, okay, the cancer already metastasized or cancer is already having local invasion. That's why the prognosis is poor. Second thing, there are two important types of esophageal cancer. First is squamous cell carcinoma and second is adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is the commonest carcinoma all over the world. Or if I take data from old wide basis, squamous cell carcinoma is the commonest. But if I take data from the developed country like the Western world, where you know because of their diet, because of the obesity or overweight in their country, adenocarcinoma is taking over the squamous cell carcinoma. Means it is already more common than squamous cell carcinoma in their country. So it depends, you know, uh, please uh, look at the questions very carefully, which is the commonest cancer, okay? Accordingly, we can answer there. Now, with this uh, small uh, concept, let's move into the topic. Esophageal carcinoma is becoming more common all over the world. It is most strongly linked to alcohol, especially spirit and smoking. Higher concentration alcohol, like spirit, okay, uh, all those uh, different terms are there. I'm sure you know that uh, better than me, okay. Those are responsible rather than light drinks. And smoking is another very, very important cause. Physical signs are rare apart from wasting and perhaps a palpable supraclavicular node. The principal symptom is dysphagia. Now see this, this is a symptom and these are the sign because it is deep inside the chest or thoracic cavity, you know. So the physical examination findings are minimal when we examine the patient. Wasting or severe loss of weight is one of the common feature of any type of malignancy. So this is a non-specific one. And another may be a palpable supraclavicular lymph node on the left side. What do we call that? Yes. What is the name? Virkos node. That's a Virko node. Very good. Excellent. That is called Virkos node. And the sign is called Troisier sign. The name of the lymph node is Virkos node, but the process which, which involves the enlargement of that is known as troisier sign. Okay, we'll talk about that. It's so common in so many, you know, intra-abdominal malignancy as well. Now, let's talk about the epidemiology of esophageal cancer. It's slightly more common in male than female. It is uncommon before 50 years of age. So it is relatively seen in the older population. And most important risk factors in case of uh, carcinoma of the esophagus are already you know, discussed in the first slide, alcohol and smoking. If we combine them together, there is a synergistic effect. And that's what exactly happens when somebody drinks. Remember, they love to smoke as well. When people drink, they like to smoke even more during that time. And the combination of this alcohol and smoking is a synergistic effect. One will potentiate the effect of other. So this is very harmful. Alcohol increases the risk by 20 fold, possibly with a latency of 15 to 20 years. Type of alcohol may be important here. Spirit are more harmful than beer or wine. Spirit means stronger drink, stronger drink where the concentration is more than 45% or 50%, okay? They are far more damaging for the esophageal mucosa than the light drinks like beer or wine. Smoking increases the risk by five-fold and has a synergistic effect with the alcohol. 
So these are considered two of the very, very important risk factors. Now, what about in China? That look because we are, we have spent so much time in China and we know Chinese people quite well. Okay, they are they love to smoke and they love to drink as well. So in China, this is one of the commonest cancer to occur. Okay. So all in, in all over Asian countries, this cancer is quite common, but in China also, you know, this is one of the commonest place to have this type of cancer. At least 50% occur in the lower third of the esophagus. In lower third of the esophagus, adenocarcinoma commonly occurs. Incident varies globally, highest in China, okay, or parts of the African country, especially South Africa. But uh, don't you know uh, be happy because of this, okay? Because it can be seen anywhere. It depends on the risk factors, and those type of risk factors are present anywhere these days. Now, regarding the dietary influences, carcinogenic nitrosamine may initiate neoplasia. This nitrosamine, okay, are present in the smoking. This nitrosamine is important, you know, said there or even in some of the food, especially uh, those food, you know, uh, which, uh, which are like a barbecued type of food, isn't it? Barbecued food, processed type of food in those type. And if somebody is having dietary deficiency of protein, vitamin C, riboflavin, and even the trace element, okay, which are known as minerals, they all have a role in lower socioeconomic group because uh, in lower socioeconomic group there is a high chance of malnutrition okay malnutrition malnutrition means lacking of these food and micronutrients so all of these play a role in the development of carcinoma esophagus especially uh, if they have certain other risk factor as well you can always add the role of antioxidant here antioxidant okay like fruits and vegetables are so much necessary these days for the prevention or protection from the cancer. Now, let's talk about some possible risk factors. Those alcohol and smoking we have already talked about, but what are the other apart from them? The principal etiological factor appears to be chronic local tissue irritation. Chronic local tissue irritation. And that can you know, result in change in the structure of the cells or tissues there, which results in cancer. So the possible risk factors for esophageal cancer include alcohol and smoking, already talked about, every student knows this now. Apart from them, achalasia. Now remember, there is 5% chance of development of cancer in achalasia. Now, what is the, what may be the mechanism that achalasia lead to cancer? Anybody? We have talked that before. Yes. Sir, there is increased the staying time of the folds or uh, which uh, uh, have the toxins. So uh, that's why lead to the uh, carcinoma. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so basically, sir, as you know, sir, uh, uh, like sir, in a collision, sir, there is a neuromuscular failure of relaxation of the lower end of the esophagus. So you we say the food there, sir, sir, is remaining for a higher time, and sir, uh, uh, um, and sir, now sir, it gives a toxic effect, and sir, this toxic effect, like sir, can, it, like, sir, can lead to the esophageal cancer. Exactly the same thing, same answer you both are giving. Absolutely, because of the obstruction. Okay, in case of atalasia there is more contact time or more contact period of the food with esophageal mucosa. And uh, who knows, all of these foods may be damaging for the esophageal mucosa, you know? So that is the reason. Very nice. Now, other are caustic structure of the esophagus. This caustic structure means, you know, if somebody has ingested alkali, okay, or even acid, especially alkali, it's known as caustic soda sometimes, now, it can really burn or damage the esophageal mucosa and it may develop stricture. Over a period of time, it may convert into cancer. Some of the countries, okay, China, okay, 
northern part of the Iran, okay, even in South Asian countries, I want to add here, and most of the other countries these days, all of them are having, you know, esophageal cancer, but China is one of the commonest. Barrett's esophagus gives through adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, okay, adenocarcinoma. It is also a type of esophageal cancer, isn't it? So you can safely write it here. plumber vincent syndrome, okay? Now, every student knows this. I've been repeating this so many times. It is common in female. There is a formation of esophageal wave, okay? Uh, it is uh, quite near to the upper esophageal sphincter in this case, because of the increased pressure in the upper esophageal sphincter side, this problem develops. It is associated with iron deficiency anemia, and it has a high, high chance of development of squamous cell carcinoma of esophagus. This is known as plumber vinson syndrome. Celiac disease. Now, what is celiac disease? Sir, sir I want to explain, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, basically, it's like, uh, 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 like sir, uh, uh, sir, it is an autoimmune disease, like sir, which mainly like sir affects the small intestine, and sir, uh, 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 um, and sir, it shows like sir, there will be, uh, uh, sir, there will be the villus atrophy, and there will be malabsorption, and sir, like there are a, a special type of antibody known as the anti-transglutaminase antibodies, and like sir, like people like who eat uh, food that is like higher in uh, uh, in. Uh, 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 Sir, in prolamin. So, sir, they are at a very, sir, sir, they are at a very higher risk of uh, celiac disease because okay. sir, this prolamin initiate a, uh, a immune response. Very good. Okay. Very nice. So, you have a good concept there, and uh, you know, let me clarify a little bit here. Celiac disease is one of the commonest cause of okay, malabsorption, which results in chronic diarrhea. This is autoimmune disease. Is absolutely correct. And this autoimmune disease, okay, is occurring if somebody is taking gluten-containing food. Gluten. Okay. Now, gluten-containing foods uh, should not be uh, given for the patients with celiac disease. This gluten is responsible for all that immunological reaction which is occurring in the small intestine, like jejunum and ileum. Because of this, the villi get damaged and they get you know, atrophied, okay? Those villi are flat now. They are not uh, like a normal uh, villi at all. So without those proper villi, there is no absorption of the food occurring, which results in chronic diarrhea. So this is the main concept of celiac disease. Basically, this is autoimmune process, and it occurs only in a genetically predisposed people who takes gluten-containing food. Remember these three things. Now, there are lots of cancers which are associated with celiac disease, but we really do not know what is the mechanism there, okay? Probably this autoimmune mechanism, the immune-mediated mechanism is responsible. One of that is lymphoma, lymphoma, T-cell lymphoma is quite common uh, association with celiac disease. Another one is esophageal cancer, but what is the connection or connecting process between them is poorly understood. Now, another is a tylosis. Tylosis is a hyperkeratosis of the palms and soul. And this is also commonly associated with esophageal cancer. So we need to examine uh, how the palms and soul look like in these type of people if they present with similar type of symptom. Now, let's talk about the pathology, how the cancer looks, okay? See this? And esophageal uh, carcinoma commences as a nodule, which then develops into either a, a papilliferous mass in 60% of the time, ulcer in 25%, or an annular constriction, usually of the cardia in other, other you know, remaining of the cases. So papilliferous mass means it is growing, it is growing inside the lumen from the mucosa. Ulcerated form. Ulcer means it is deeper. It is going downwards or deeper area now. But annular constriction means it is growing from the all over. It's a circumferential like of growth. Okay. From the whole circumference of the tube, the, the cancer mass is growing towards the lumen. This is known as annular type of constriction. So these are the gross morphological features. 
Historically, historically, the large majority of the esophageal carcinomata are squamous. Today, the incidence of adenocarcinoma is rising rapidly and now accounts for 50% of all esophageal carcinomata in the USA. Okay, carcinomata is a plural form. So in the USA or in any developed country, remember the incidence of uh, adenocarcinoma is increasing, I already told you. So uh, in, their, in their country, or if somebody is attempting that type of question, why I'm, I am you know, explaining like this is, many of our students may you know, appear for some other board exam later on in the future. Like who knows, USMLE, even Australian medical exam, even PLAB, even other country exam, right? So if the question comes like that, you know, you should be very careful here. Okay? So make sure you know these facts. That's why these points are important. Squamous carcinoma typically arises in the upper two thirds of the esophagus, whereas adenocarcinoma arises in the lower one third of the esophagus and from the Barrett esophagus. Okay, it's quite easy to understand. Now, see there, uh, this is the picture which I borrowed from pathology. So, look here, look this mass here. This is ulcerated mass at the center, but the margins are quite elevated. Okay, these are called hip top margin, but the center is ulcerated. This is a lumen of the esophagus. Okay, so there is a big mass there. So undoubtedly, this is carcinoma of the stomach. Sorry, carcinoma of the esophagus. Now, this is adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. You can clearly, you know, guess why it is called adenocarcinoma. Look at the gland forming tissues here, and this pale mucosa belongs to the esophagus. And this rugosities are the stomach. So it is present right at the lower end of the esophagus and very near to the uh, you know, stomach junction. So this is the malignancy here, this area. Now, how to do staging of esophageal cancer? Staging means extent of the spread. We all know that. So how to know that or how to do that? Staging of the esophageal carcinoma is important in order to try to prevent unnecessary surgical intervention. If the stage is already advanced, you don't go for any surgery. That is useless. That is not necessary. You rather harm the patient by doing surgery rather than helping. Okay? Rather, we, we provide them palliative therapy, not the surgery. That's why staging is very, very necessary here. There are several complementary means of determining the staging. These are chest X-ray, barium swallow, ultrasound examination, especially of the abdomen, CT scan and MRI scan, and bronchoscopy. These all are different type of test or investigation which are necessary to make sure cancer is spread till where, which type of organs are affected. See this? These are the different stages. Let's make it very easy. Stage one is the cancer limited to the esophagus and it is less than five centimeter in length. Stage two, it is limited to the esophagus, but it is greater than five centimeter in length and uh, with resectable node. Still resectable nodes are there. Lymph nodes are affected, but we can remove them. Stage three, lesion greater than 10 centimeter in length extension through the esophagus into adjacent structure, inoperable node or inoperable lesion. Means there is local invasion already. Whenever it is locally invaded, you know, then it is difficult to remove it completely. Okay, there are lots of damage if we, if we plan surgery here. And stage four, lesion as in stage three, that is greater than 10 centimeter in length, Okay, with evidence of perforation, fistula formation, or distant metastasis. The perforation and fistula formation are the result of extensive local destruction or local invasion. This is the hallmark of any malignancy. And distant metastasis, okay, now the cancer is not uh, curable probably, only palliative treatment can be given.
now along after discussing all these things okay let's talk about the clinical features it is very easy for you to understand because most of the concept is provided already the most important symptom of carcinoma of the esophagus is dysphagia dysphagia means difficulty to swallow difficulty in swallowing the food this is progressive type of dysphagia it is increasing day by day or week by week over a period of time the dysphagia is increasing it initially affect the solid food only but gradually affecting the swallowing of liquid as well because the mass is increasing remember in the beginning probably the mass was not that big but later on the mass is increasing week by week month by month so this is the problem individual may slowly alter the diet from solid to liquid remember older person who complain i am having difficulty to swallow the solid food and he is you know making his food more liquid type suspect esophageal cancer in that older person especially if the person is decreasing appetite okay or losing weight these two points are always there with any malignancy suspect esophageal cancer at the earliest because once the person develops full blown dysphagia you know you cannot do anything the cancer is already well advanced the level at which difficulty in swallowing is encountered it may be identifiable by the patient okay and sometimes it may be too late already a short history of dysphagia in an elderly male is almost certainly carcinoma of the esophagus or the cardia of the stomach such an important point so dysphagia should be taken very seriously in the elderly person don't ignore it don't say oh it is because of age because of age anyone can have that please don't say that try at least try to find out you know at least take him to the hospital and do endoscopy upper gi endoscopy or esophagoscopy that is the most important investigation here and that will confirm whether the uh, you know disease is cancer or not now an infrequent presentation is of the obstruction of a large bolus of food with no prior history of dysphagia why is this because patient was maintaining it okay patient was maintaining the swallowing probably by altering the altering the texture of the food patient was not eating that hard type of food or solid food okay and it also depends on how big is the mass inside so sometimes patient may present with obstruction with a large bolus of the food which is stuck there other local features may include so here these are quite important to understand regurgitation of food or blood stain vomit regurgitation because of complete obstruction and blood stain vomit is because of bleeding there because of ulceration bleeding is also quite common patient may present with aspiration pneumonia again because of this regurgitation of food and pain classically the pain is present in the retrosternal area behind the sternum and sometimes in the interscapular region also on the back side and it may radiate to the jaws and arms just like myocardial pain remember myocardial pain and esophageal pain are the differential diagnosis we have been talking about the clinical features of carcinoma esophagus the most important symptom is dysphagia that is progressive dysphagia now apart from that what are the other general manifestation which occurs there see here the general manifestations of any malignant disease may include the following they are loss of weight due to the metabolic effects of the tumor and a reduced intake of the food now, these are the main uh, two reasons one because of anorexia the person doesn't want to eat and second okay this is highly metabolic condition tumor this this neoplastic cell they consume most of the nutrients which we take and they are rapidly growing you know so uh, this is another reason for weight loss over a shorter duration anemia is also commonly seen anemia 
the person is anemic. Coughing occurs due to regurgitation of the food into the airway, that is trickling of the food down into the airway, or because of the formation of the fistula, this is seen. This fistula formation is already very, very serious condition. This is already inoperable, okay? Fistula formation between the trachea and the esophagus. This is acquired type of tracheoesophageal fistula, which is caused by local invasion by the malignancy. Edema may occur there because of malnutrition. This is a feature of malnutrition. This is again, very non-specific one. And secondary deposit may occur in different organ. Uh, they may start from the lymph node and ultimately, okay, lungs, liver, bones, brain, okay, any of the organ may be affected. Let's move on. Now, diagnosis is done by a good history taking and physical examination. Now, history taking, remember, will again focus on dysphagia and all those features which we have just discussed. You should ask questions related to those. If a, a good answer is not coming, you can ask some leading question here. Now, the important investigation for the confirmation of the diagnosis is barium swallow. Barium swallow is the first line investigation after the history of dysphagia. I have to take the patient to the barium swallow and there is a characteristic image of an irregular structure or filling defect is seen in the barium swallow that can be of different length, okay? Can be a different length, remember, according to the stage and it often looks tortuous. It is quite classical, the filling defect. A tracheoesophageal fistula may also be demonstrated in a very advanced state. Now see there, okay? So all of you please uh, focus here. This is, look at this area here, this area. This area looks a bit dilated, okay? The lower area also looks fine, but why the caliber of this area is less, isn't it? So this is a question to be asked. Some mass is growing probably here. Okay. This is the way we always think. And another, look at this way. It is called filling defect. There is a narrowing at this area. Okay. So these are the important point. Let's move on. Now other uh, types of uh, investigation we like to do is endoscopy and biopsy. It establishes the histology and limits of the lesion. The surgeon can directly visualize where is the lesion first, and then they can take a biopsy from there and send to the histopathology lab and confirm the diagnosis. It can be used therapeutically as well, especially to dilate the obstructed site if there is any. So improving nutrition before a definitive operative intervention. Okay, so for example, if there is narrow area as a result of mass, if person is having difficulty to swallowing, then according, uh, with the help of endoscopy, we can dilate so patient can uh, eat a little bit better. Cytology is another investigation which can be done. The cytology means only the cells are obtained and these uh, cells are obtained by washing or abrasion technique. This is not by endoscopy, okay? So it is used for a screening test in China. CT scanning can be done to determine the mediastinal involvement and whether metastasis has occurred to the liver or not. A CT scan can be done of any suspected area, especially if you have some symptom. For example, how, I know, how you know that liver metastasis has occurred? Yes, how you know that? The jaundice, jaundice will be there. Jaundice and any other feature? Yes, very good. Jaundice is one of that. Another feature? There is palpable liver. Palpa palpable. Portal hypertension. Yes, palpable nodule there. There is a enlargement of the liver. There is pain in the right hypochondrium. There is jaundice. Isn't it? All of these are the features that you suspect. Yes, probably liver is affected here. Okay. So after that, CT scan is done to confirm that. 
or even ultrasound can be done for that. Bronchoscopy may be needed to exclude bronchial involvement in upper and middle third of the lesion because of the local invasion, the bronchus and the trachea may be involved. So this is one of the investigation for us. An ultrasound may be used to identify second liver deposit, but CT scan is always better than the ultrasound regarding that. Now, the final part is the management. I already told you in the beginning of this lecture that this is one of the cancer which is very difficult to manage or treat or cure. Okay, now see here. Management of esophageal carcinoma is dependent on the level of the lesion, level of the lesion and the stage of the disease. Now, level of the lesion means which part of the esophagus is affected. Is it upper part or upper one third? Is it middle one third or is it lower one third? In the upper one third of the esophageal cancer, high dose radiotherapy is indicated for lesions up to five centimeter long. So radiotherapy is important modality of treatment here. Squamous cell carcinoma are you know, usually treated by the radiotherapy. Vital structures in the mediastinums are closely related to the upper third, make surgical clearance and resection very difficult. This is the main reason why surgery is difficult here because uh, it is present in the thoracic cavity or the chest. And there are so many big blood vessels there, so many other vital structures there, you know, heart, lung, everything are there. So it is difficult to do surgery here. In middle third of the esophageal cancer, early tumors are resectable, early tumors are resectable, but if they are widespread, if there is extensive local invasion and things like that, then radiotherapy is indicated once again. Now, lower third lesions, okay, lower third lesions are lower one third of the esophagus. They are most accessible surgically. And adenocarcinomas are most common there in the lower one third of the esophagus because the Barrett esophagus, we all know that. And these adenocarcinoma are mainly treated by surgery. They are usually radio resistant type of tumor. Now, squamous cell carcinoma are radio sensitive, means radiation therapy is used very commonly there, whereas adenocarcinoma are mainly radio resistant. Extensive disease requires palliative, palliative therapy. Okay. Now, palliative therapy is done uh, to make the quality of life a bit better for that patient. Already they are out of the you cure, you know, we cannot cure them, but let's make their life a bit better. If they are not able to swallow, let's, let's make them, you know, uh, so that they, they can easily swallow the food. They can enjoy the food, you know, they, they can have painless life or painless death. Whatever time they have, they can meet their family member, their friends, they can do whatever things they like. So all of these are the you know, parts of palliation therapy. So we, we go for endoscopic laser surgery for lesion less than eight centimeter long, okay? So that dysphagia is decreased now. Esophageal stenting can be done with a celestine tube. This is artificial device, which can be kept there. And alternatives include esophago gastrostomy or esophago jejunostomy. Now we'll see there, okay, anastomosing esophagus with stomach after resecting, okay, that affected area. Or esophagus is connected with the jejunum directly by bypassing the uh, stomach. Short course radiotherapy also can be given just to decrease the tumor mass. This is known as debulking therapy, decrease the bulk of the tumor. So all of these are a different palliative therapy. They do not cure the disease. Now, how effective is the treatment? Of all the treatment measures for esophageal carcinoma, only surgical resection can offer a reasonable chance for a cure, 15 to 20% Pfizer survival rate, just 15 to 20%. So uh, this is a very less in comparison to the other. And 
if surgery can be done, then you are a bit, a bit more assured than the other type of treatment. A significant proportion of the presenting individuals are either too old or have too many intercurrent illness to consider the radical treatment. They are older people. The older people may have some comorbid conditions. Remember that they may be having COPD, which is uncontrolled. They may be having uncontrolled type of diabetes or hypertension or other types of cancer, chronic kidney condition, maybe chronic heart condition. So they may be, you know, uh, not fit for surgery or radical treatment. Hence, about a third of the patient present with advanced esophageal cancer are symptomatic and require palliation. Now, finally, what is the prognosis? Okay, the prognosis depends on the site of the tumor. If it is upper one third, middle one third, or lower one third, because lower one third can be resected quite early, so probably you know a uh, uh, prognosis is a little bit better. And upper one third, okay upper one third, uh, uh, we can uh, provide radiotherapy. Okay. Surgery is not uh, you know, possible or not usually done because of the chance of damage to the vital structures in the thoracic cavity. And the different things are there for the prognosis. But overall, the most important indicator for the prognosis is how early patient comes to the hospital. How early? It depends on the stage. If it stays one and two, Probably the prognosis is better. Stage three and four, very poor. So upper third tumor have 20% five-year survival. Middle third, okay, 6%. And lower third, 15%. But this may change drastically according to the stage. So we don't only rely on this. See here, the prognosis depends on so many other factors as well. What is the tumor size and site? What is the depth of the invasion? What is the you know, stage of nodal metastasis as well as distant widespread metastasis? What is the grade of the tumor? Now, grade is histological. Okay? Is it well differentiated? Is it poorly differentiated? What is the lymphocytic response? This lymphocytic response is important for radiotherapy response. And what is the general health of the patient overall? Can I go for radical treatment or not? Can the patient withstand surgery? Can the patient withstand radiotherapy or not? If patient cannot withstand, then how can we cure, isn't it? Prognosis is already poor. So all these things are there for the prognosis of esophageal cancer. But one sentence I can clearly say here, it is one of the cancer which has got poorest prognosis among the cancers. Okay, so at the end, I like to uh, request you all to like the video as much as possible, share it among your friends and subscribe to the channel so that it will encourage me a lot for the future videos and recordings. Thank you so much.